Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to our second PowerPoint for the week. Uh, we got my daughter again being adorable with her belly hanging out there. She got her backpack on. She got her twigs. She's just watching, probably waiting for a dog to go by so she could start yelling Wan Wan at it. She's being adorable. All right, so back to things that are not adorable again. We get to look at our actual nature of apartheid now. This is the the system itself. Last time we got all the background up, we talked about the fact that segregation was starting much before apartheid. Now we get to see the actual system of apartheid itself. And you might be thinking at this point with how bad the segregation got last time, like, how could you really get worse than that? Here we go. So we already did uh, this thing. This is the activity that you guys would have done uh, earlier in the week in between the first PowerPoint and this PowerPoint. So that's just, uh, that's there, that's available. You know how to do it already, you did it. This is the actual apartheid stuff. So the National Party, the NP, won that 1948 election, just barely, but they did manage to do it. And they are going to uh, right away start implementing apartheid. A lot of these, as I mentioned already, are just expanding on what we already saw with segregation but they're either going to um, make it more strict, make it worse, make it more wide-ranging, um, all kinds of options just to just really make this terrible for, um, well, I was going to say for everybody involved, but if you're a white person in South Africa, it actually works out pretty well for you for a couple of decades. So by the time we hit 54, the pace of this legislation kind of slows down a little bit. Mostly that's because all the foundational stuff is laid down from 48 to 54. That does not mean, however, that it stops. In fact, some of the biggest apartheid legislation is passed after 54. It's just um, the, the overall speed of things being passed slows down. So apartheid gets split more or less into two overall categories. You have petty apartheid, which you often see the term boss cop to, to talk about it, which is boss rule. Again, I'm sure I'm horribly mispronouncing that. This is the early stage of apartheid. And it focuses on what we had already seen with previous segregation, which is economic and political domination of whites over blacks. Um, the, the term petty apartheid is kind of um, hinting at that that this is more of like the day-to-day -day social stuff, right? Um, I have never been a big fan of that because petty apartheid makes it sound like it's not that serious, you know, it's just petty. Um, we're seeing some really horrendous stuff. It's just in comparison to the next step, which is grand apartheid, it is um, lesser. So Boskop then refers to that uh, forceful, de decisive approach that is taken by the government in doing this. That's why it's called boss rule. Um, and it's very much um, meant to kind of convey this sense of authority and, and like power and leadership in that uh, Boer community. So the next step then, which we get not really a strict time frame for, it's kind of like the mid to late 1950s is when it starts, is Grand Apartheid. And this is the later stage of it, kind of the end goal of apartheid. And this goes beyond racial discrimination to complete racial and territorial separation and segregation of South Africa. So basically they wanted to make a white South Africa and a black South Africa that were completely independent of each other. Um, there would of course be the aspect of like all the good stuff was taken by the whites already and the, the, the white South Africa would have domination over the black, black South Africa, but it was basically a way for white South Africa to continue to take advantage of the Africans while having absolutely no responsibility for caring for them in any way, which they already weren't doing that much anyway. But this basically gives them a buffer zone. It allows them to um, kind of dodge the negative or try to dodge the negative reactions from the global community. It's not going to work. It's actually going to backfire on them. But the idea here is they can turn to the global community and be like, look, we're not mistreating them because they're not even our citizens. Um, which, eh. and you might notice now that every time I move the mouse, I have this annoying thing because I have had to stoop so low as to use Google Slides. Ugh, terrible. So, expanding segregation. One of the very first things we see out of this new NP government is the 1949 Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act. This is our first major piece of apartheid legislation. 
And it um, basically identified a problem, air quotes, in South African society, which was that uh, all those black people were marrying into white people and, like, you know, eugenics, destroying the, their white blood and, like, under, uh, just unraveling the, the strands that hold society together. Not only is this clearly not a uh, problem of black people marrying white people, it was completely imagined in South Africa as well. In the three years before 1949, there were a grand total of 75 mixed-race marriages in all of South Africa. That's, what, 25 a year? Um, clearly just a, a massive endemic problem they had to, to fix. So uh, this is going to um, extend on to what we had already seen with, uh, with previous segregation laws, for example, um, disallowing sexual relations between unmarried white and black people, because now it's saying, hey, you can't even get married. If you were already married, eh, maybe in that, that gray zone there, but you definitely couldn't have new marriages. They then followed up that 1927 act and this 1949 act with the 1950 Immorality Act that says any relations between whites and non-whites were bad. They were not allowed. Any sexual relation between any white and non-white person was barred. It was off limits. It was not allowed. Um, any like you know non-white groups like uh, like an Indian and a uh, African that's fine. But uh, they they didn't want to to dirty again heavy air quotes there the the blood of the white race because obviously based on eugenics which is pseudoscience that was the um, the superior race and they wanted to protect that blood. How would they enforce this? You ask. Well, in the most intrusive way possible. Um, People in the neighborhood would be on the lookout. You know, most white families in South Africa would have been in support of this kind of thinking. So, you know, they'd keep a lookout. And if there was a um, suspicious couple that they were concerned about, they would tip off the police. The police would then stake out that house, wait until the middle of the night, and then just break into the house, like bust down the doors, run in there trying to uh, catch them in the act, so to speak. Um, and if they did catch them in the act, uh, pretty much exclusively, although the the white criminal, air quotes here, uh, would be, you know, they'd receive a, a punishment, usually a fine. Um, the non-white criminal would be punished much harsher because, again, it is about controlling and punishing non-white people. That is the goal of this kind of stuff. In 1950, we also see a... Uh, another act kind of extending out this ideology of, of races and separation and things like that with the 1950 Population Registration Act. This was designed to uh, categorize everybody in South Africa. There were three uh, strict racial categories and you would be separated out into one of those categories and um, your like possessions and uh, like home ownership or property ownership or like job possibilities, those would all be decided by whatever race category you were in. This does mean that like if you were in a mixed race marriage, for example, after 1950, where any interracial relationships are not allowed, your marriage can be broke up, your family could be broken up, everybody had to register. And you all register, you get a, an ID card with your group name on it, and you are either white colored or Bantu, which is black, African black. Uh, colored included a, a wide range of things. It could be, again, like a, a mixed race, white and black. Uh, it could be Indian. It could be Asian. Um, Asians they used as a catch-all term that would include Indians as well. Uh, so it's just kind of everybody who doesn't directly fit into white or black. And there's a lot of wiggle room there. So there would be people that would be originally classified as white and they get moved to colored or colored to Bantu. Um, so that middle group there was uh, some kind of movement with. This act is then amended in 64 and 67 uh, to put more emphasis on both physical appearance and genealogy, because this allowed them to classify people um, in whatever way was most convenient for them. Like if they looked black, if they looked too black, they could be classified as Bantu. But also like if there was like a light skinned color person, right? Because you could be mixed race and look pretty white. Well, then they'd go to the genealogy thing and be like, well, you're actually not genealogically white, so you are colored. Uh, to, to kind of like keep people from passing off as white and getting those uh, those benefits from being white in South African society. In addition to doing all of this categorization, they did something really um, like devious here. 
they made it so that a bunch of services in South Africa were available only for whites, for Africaners, the, the ones in that white category, which meant that even if people weren't, you know, particularly supportive of racial categorization, they now had a lot of benefits that were dependent on them being classified as white and this Population Registration Act, which means that they would support its continuation because they benefited from it, even if they didn't personally really care too much about the categorization of races. In order to facilitate um, the kind of day-to-day -day running of this population registration, they set up this thing called the Race Classification Board. And the Race Classification Board is the, the government body that got to decide if you were white, if you were colored, or if you were black. So anytime where um, that was disputed or there was any kind of um, call that needed to be made on it, that would then be decided by this Race Classification Board. And either you could request to have, like, usually if you were, like, colored and you wanted to get moved up to white because you wanted to get some of those benefits from it, you can try to do that. But a lot of times people could also, like, your race classification could be considered without you asking for it. Um, like, you know, maybe police ask for it or, like, another concerned citizen says, like, you know, that you should check out this person. And you could actually just one day be white and then suddenly the race classification board lets you know, like, hey, just a heads up, you're colored now. Um, or, you know, one day you were colored and suddenly like, hey, you're Bantu now. Uh, they could just decide what race you were basically on a whim because it was incredibly subjective. It was left up to them what the exact meaning of uh, these races was and they could do whatever they wanted with it. And in order to do those classifications, they instituted all kinds of really uh, scientific, air quotes because sarcasm, tests there, like uh, school measurements. Remember those things we talked about with eugenics? Yeah, that was actually a, uh, a way that they would classify race in South Africa. Um, there was also really famously this thing called the pencil test because Africans tended to have um, like uh, how do I want to say, like, like coarser, thicker hair, right? So kind of like, you know, Afro style, you could stick a pencil in it and it'll stay in there. Whereas Europeans tended to have like more flat, um, like looser hair. So you couldn't really stick a pencil in there. Uh, it, it would fall out. So they would literally just stick a pencil in somebody's hair. And if it stayed in there, that affected your classification. Whereas if it fell out, then maybe that means you're white. Uh, they also had linguistic and proficiency, or linguistic proficiency tests. They had like, um, uh, Oh my gosh, my brain is is completely uh, literacy tests. There we go uh, to to classify whether or not like you could speak good enough English. Because again, those eugenics they believed that Africans were just of lesser intelligence. So if you scored poorly on those, that's a sign that you're Bantu. Apparently, um, these tests were clearly not scientific, and they made the system so subjective that in multiple cases there was actually family members so siblings where one would be classified as white and one would be classified as colored and one would be classified as colored and one would be classified as bantu um i'm not aware of any where one was classified as white and one was bantu just because those are so far apart in terms of classification but because this whole process is so subjective even the board that was in charge of classifying people would routinely classify people as as different groups even if they were the same again you're a sibling like it's impossible for one sibling to be colored and one sibling to be white if they both have the same parents they would both be colored or they would both be white but according to the race classification board that is not the case 1950 was a big year for legislation we also had the group areas act uh this is one of the contenders, it's it's pretty hard as usual to pick out like the most important legislation, but this is one of the contenders for the most important uh, apartheid legislation. Um, this is referred to by D.H. Mallon, who was one of the architects of apartheid, as the essence of apartheid. So if one of the people who started this whole system um, identifies this as like the essence of the system, then clearly it's got a lot of importance behind it. The justification for this, once again, goes back to eugenics. Basically, Malin argues here that uh, Africans are by nature a rural people, and therefore they thrive in the countryside, and being in the city is actually bad for them. Being a part of city life is detrimental. It'll They, they won't know what to do with it. It will corrupt them. Uh, this, this is a... 
a very eugenics idea, but it's around even before that, like um, back like our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson in particular, would talk about like the the um, the noble savage when he talked about Native Americans, and he basically argued that like they were so like untouched by civilization and culture that they were like man in its purest form. And it sounds like he's like complimenting them, but he's basically saying they're so uncivilized that like that they're uncorrupted by society. So they're making that same argument here as if somebody can be genetically suited to to countryside life as opposed to city life, which again, there is no scientific foundation for that at all, but that's what eugenics is all about is pseudoscience. So using this justification, they expanded out that idea that cities are for whites only. And they specifically said, not only are cities like for the use of whites, inner city areas are whites only. All non-whites just completely removed. You're not allowed to be there. If you are a black person working in the city, you need to be living out in the suburbs on the outskirts of town. This had already been happening previously because we had that idea of cities being for the exclusive use of whites, but now it's even more official. It's, it's, it's core to the, um, the, the essence, the, the city life of all of South Africa, not just parts of it. This meant that you were then kind of screwed, right? Because based on the idea of the reserves that had been set up, if you were black, you're not allowed to own property outside of reservations. But you need to be able to live near the city if you're going to be doing work in the city and the cities need unskilled labor. They can't get by without it. So the the supporters of apartheid have to support this weird system where they're like, hey, whites are only, or uh, cities are only for whites, but black people, it's okay if you work here. You just can't like stay here. At the end of the workday, you have to go home, you know, to the outskirts to go live in those suburbs, which again are not countryside. So even if we're going with their, de their justification here, right, that Africans are a rural people, um, they're still living in the suburbs. Um, so it's just a, a way to consolidate city life and make it white. This does also hurt non-black people in South Africa. Because remember, it says whites only. That means the colored category. A really big category here was Indian business owners. There were a decent number of Indians in South Africa, and a lot of them were business owners. So there was also a lot of white business owners that supported this Group Areas Act, not even really caring about the African side of things. They were just like, hey, less competition for us. Because if you're Indian, that means you can't have your business in the city anymore because cities are for whites only. So this has a, a very wide-ranging effect. In 1952, we get a really misleading name for an act. So um, the official name for this is the Natives Act. It's uh, got a much longer name, the Abolition of Passes and Coordination of Documents Act. Sometimes it's just called the Abolition of Passes. So I remember last time I said that uh, every now and then you get two or three separate terms for the same thing. Yeah, Natives Act, Abolition of Passes and Coordination of Documents Act, Abolition of Passes. But Abolition of Passes sounds good, right? They're going to get rid of those passes we talked about last time. But this is actually, um, it does get rid of those passes, but it replaces them with much worse passes. So those old pass books, gone. New ones, 96 pages long. Look at this. This is a, a sample of one of those passes. You can see it even has tabs for like different categories. So we got the labor bureau. That's going to be like all about your job. You got your employer's name, address, signature. You've got your tax information. Uh, we got the Bantu authorities tax. We'll talk about the uh, the Bantu authorities stuff later. It's basically just um, the the homelands, the reservation stuff. Um, additional particulars, including concessions in respect of curfews. So any kind of like. Um, uh, law problems or law concessions that you have going on for you. Uh, you've got all these areas. There's going to be an area for like stamping on your pass. It's got your picture. It's got uh, what group you're a part of. And if you're Bantu, if you're black, it actually breaks it down to like what tribal group you're a part of. Um, and you've got to have all this stuff with you at all times. So it's got your employment record, your tax payments, encounters with police. It is actually a criminal offense for you not to carry this with you if you're black. If you're white, you don't need one. But if you're black, you have to carry this with you and you have to present it at any time for any reason. If you don't, you are guilty of a crime. And it's not just the police you have to present it to. Any white person, even a child, can go up to a black person under this law in South Africa and demand to see their passbook. 
So you could be walking down the street, you know, a, a middle-aged black person doing your job, whatever, you're all set up, and some 10-year-old little white kid can come up and demand to see your passbook. And if you refuse to show it, you are in violation of the law. You can be arrested. You can be removed from the city. You can be sent back to a reserve, even if you're not from the reserve. Uh, this is an incredibly demeaning system that is applying only to non-whites. If you wanted to go anywhere, you had to get permit stamps for it. So um, you would also often need multiple stamps. So let's say, for example, you're living in a reserve. You want to go to the city to make money. You first have to get a stamp giving you permission to go to the city and to travel to the city. And that could be multiple stamps. But let's just say it's one. You get your travel to a city from a rural area stamp. You get to the city. Within 72 hours, you have to then get another stamp saying you've arrived in the city. And then you have to get a job, at which point you get another stamp. And if you can't get a job, you're screwed because you came to the city because you don't have money, which means you can't go back to your reserve because you don't have money. But if you stay in the city without a job, you are now a criminal and you're in violation of the law. So um, like you can't really set up a job before you go to the city. So now you're basically just um, living in the city illegally and it has a huge uh, crime problem then and you've got people that are getting caught by the police in prison then being sent back to the reserves even if your passbook is entirely in order everything's on the up and up you got all your stamps this is still a common uh, way for the police or for white people in the cities just to um, harass the, the Africans in the cities. It was a, a way to enforce segregation, to enforce a power structure people over people. Um, it was a way to keep surveillance over eventual resistance groups because that information would be then uh, noted in your passbook um, and they could just stop you at any time. Again, they don't need any kind of suspicion. They could just stop and demand to see your stuff and you have to show it to them. Um, so this is going to be a, a big part when we get to like the resistance of this, of like burning of passbooks and stuff like that is going to be a really common uh, res resistance technique just because of how much animosity this causes. Oh, and by the way, the reason why this doesn't look like it's 96 pages long is because it's a photocopy, so you can't really see the depth of it. Going forward throughout the 50s here, we get the 1953 Bantu Education Act. And this is another one that um, we're, we're going to get increasingly, um, at least for me, the, I, I get increasingly frustrated as I talk about this stuff because it just becomes more and more unfair and more and more egregious. So in 1953, the Bantu Education Act says that schools are only allowed to be monoracial. You cannot have a mixed race school. You're either a white school or a colored school or a black school. Um, and even within black schools, they sometimes then broke it up into like, you could be like a Zosa school or a Zulu school. Like you couldn't be just, you know, a, a mixed school. The education for black schools was then put under a, a new department called the Native Affairs Department. And the Native Affairs Department was headed by this guy, Verward, who is an apartheid hardliner. So you have somebody who essentially hates black people and is trying to segregate them and, and take away all their power, who is now in charge of their education system. This means that you now have an entirely different curriculum and system of support. And I put support in air quotes in here for a reason we'll talk about in a second for education of different races. The education of, of black children then, it should be no surprise since it's being decided by somebody who doesn't like black people, is grossly inferior. We are talking uh, an education system that intentionally does not teach them. It gives them extremely basic literacy. It gives them extremely basic life skills and sets them up directly to only work either in domestic or unskilled labor. Books and supplies are basically non-existent. Classrooms are horrendous. This is a, uh, an African school in South Africa under this system. The spending ratio is seven to one. So for every $1 spent for black students, you would get $7 spent for white students. And remember, two thirds of South Africa was black. So this ratio is even worse than it seems because that's already a bad ratio, but then you got to add in that, that seven to one, that one has vastly more people than the seven that they are trying to, to manage with it. 
And it doesn't stop there. It actually keeps on getting worse because that new curriculum they set up for Bantu, Bantu schools is going to be incredibly imperialistic and racist. It directly teaches the black students that they are being taught at a slower pace because they had a slower intellectual pace and therefore they couldn't be taught at the same level as white students. Even though they had previously been taught at the same level as white students, the, the Bantu um, Education Act is now just deciding, nope, you can't keep up, so we got to slow it down for you. It taught uh, young Africans that they had backward communities, they had a backward culture, that they were uncultured, and the best they could hope for in life is to work in service to whites who were objectively better than they were. This is like not like I'm not summarizing down what they were taught here. This is what students were taught under this system. The teachers in these black schools then would get incredibly low salaries, so most black teachers left the profession altogether because they couldn't support anybody with it. So the people you do get are unqualified, they are teachers in heavy air quotes because they don't have any experience or qualifications to teach, and the schools became such low quality that a lot of parents just took their children out of the school altogether. In fact, a big protest against this was removing uh, children from the school, and Verward, in response, threatened that anybody who did take their child out of school would never be eligible for any public education ever again. So basically threatened to take education away if they tried to do anything about this. In 59, this is extended out to universities. So we get the University Education Act, which applies basically the same standards to those there were basically no colleges that were admitting non-white students in the first place, but those that did were forced to choose what race they admitted. And again, even the all African schools were then forced to serve only one tribal group. So um, Nelson Mandela's school, for example, which was actually a decently prestigious uh, African school in South Africa, had to become a Zosa only school because that was the, the tribal group that they were allowed to serve. So this started out with lower education, it went to higher education, and um, this is definitely the kind of thing you see, um, I, again, I, I go back to Hitler for this one just because the eugenics connection on it, but um, Hitler did this to the Polish during World War II. Um, when my dad was young, uh, calling somebody a Pole was like a, it was an insult. It was like, they're, they're uneducated, it's stupid. Like, even to this day, if you, if you talk to an older person, ask them what the word Pole implies and it's it's they're, they're stupid and that's because the germans in world war ii when they took over poland they wanted to use them for manual labor the same way we're seeing in south africa so they did pretty much the same thing they did not allow them to get above an elementary school education and they forced them into um, this this service style and this is one of those things that long term has a huge effect because education is how you further yourself as as a people as a group how are you going to move up in society Society, if you've got no education, no training, no skills to put into a job, even if you took all these segregationist laws away at this point, you've got an entire generation of, of Africans who don't have training, that don't have an education, and are going to be stuck in unskilled labor because that's all they are able to do because of this legislation, not just this one, but everything we've seen so far. Then we get to... Um, kind of the, the high point of petty apartheid and the, the movement beyond that into grand apartheid. So remember that petty apartheid was all about like political, economic, social control over black South Africans. So when we get the Reservation of Separate Amenities Act, we're basically looking at um, like the, the high point of that. What this does is, as its name, as name applies, is it segregates pretty much all public amenities. This is basically Jim Crow America, only uh, significantly worse. So areas that had already been segregated are gonna get even further segregated. Uh, service areas, waiting areas for transit, public facilities like parks and pools, but even like, look at this bench right here, right? Europeans only. They went so far as to segregate benches. Uh, hotels and restaurants and city centers wouldn't even let black people in the door. So it was like even beyond like we're not going to serve you. It's like you can't even come into this building. Um, there would be like separate entrances for black people. Like maybe if they worked at that place, they'd have to come in the side entrance or if like a business offered um, services to both black and white people, it would still have like a side entrance for black people. Um, I think one of the pictures I included in our activity last week um, 
even had the the sign for like there was like meat for black people in particular like the butcher would sell a lower quality meat for africans than they would for for white south africans so um it's everything that we saw in jim crow era america but just somehow even more racist and more segregated this is um kind of supported by that 1950 group areas act right because basically the argument they make is well if cities are for white people we don't need to apply any or supply any services for black people right like why would we give amenities to black people in an area where they're not supposed to be like that's just common sense of course we wouldn't put any kind of amenities in there so they try to back it up using the uh the previous legislation they had going for it now, obviously, this is going to have really um, negative impacts that things we've already talked about, like, you know, worse facilities, poor education, loss of resources like libraries, erosion of position in society. But what I really want you to consider here is just how much of an impact this has on the presence of black people in South Africa. And this is why I say it's so much worse than Jim Crow. Because in Jim Crow America, segregation occurred, but black people were still present. They were still there. Like white people and black people still had to interact, you know, day to day. But with this, think of how impossible it's going to be for any given white person and any, any given black person to have any kind of real interaction with each other. How are you as a white person in South Africa um, and let's assume that you're not super racist, right? Like you're actually like middle of the road. You could go either way. How are you ever, ever going to meet and befriend a black South African at this point? Now think again to the civil rights movement, how we talked about the the bulk, the power behind the civil rights movement was, was black activists. But at the end of the day, it was vital that they got support from white America because who gets to vote? It's the white Americans, right? That's even more so in South Africa because technically in America, black people were allowed to vote. Whereas at this point in South Africa, legally they get no voting rights. So if anything's gonna change, it has to come from the white community and there's no way for them to have meaningful interactions with black South Africans to really change their mind about this. So this is incredibly insidious and really, really dangerous. And it only just occurs to me that I, I had meant um, at the beginning of last PowerPoint to point something out about those other pictures you guys were looking at. There was one picture which I marked something along the lines of like South African Parliament being addressed by British uh, Prime Minister or something like that. And what I was really hoping you would get out of that is look at that room. And if you don't remember it, go back and just look at that picture really quick. How many non-white people are in there? That is entirely being decided by white people. There is not a single black person in that picture. And that is like, that's, they're running the government that way, right? So this piece of basically removing Africans from city life, from day-to-day -day involvement with white South Africans is, is massive. Uh, and it's unavoidable at that point. So by the time we hit the mid 1950s, we're going to start seeing um, grand apartheid kind of taking over. And we can see early stages of this with the 1954 Re uh, Native Resettlement Act and the 1955 Group Areas Development Act. These are both, again, expansions on the Group Areas Act. That's why I mentioned that, you know, this is a, a huge part of it. It's a contender for the most important because it's setting up a pattern of there is now a, a, a problem with these things called black spots. They're black areas and white suburbs. There's also mixed population areas in cities because again, they've got black and colored workers in the city and those workers need to live somewhere. So they're not allowed to live in city centers. So they start moving into the suburbs or the outskirts of the city. Well, now they set up these natives resettlement boards to get rid of these areas. And the most prominent one is Sophia Town. Both of these pictures are from Sophia Town. And Sophia Town was prominent because it was actually a pretty big center for African culture and intellectual and political activity and anti-apartheid activity when it comes up. This is, in terms of like city life or suburban life, one of the most vital uh, African neighborhoods in South Africa. And the apartheid government really wants to get rid of it. Well, now they have the ability to do so with these new acts. So in January of 1955, you get a bunch of armed police that move into the area. 
They go house to house, forcing the residents out. The residents have to load all their belongings onto a truck. Anything they can't bring with them is left behind. And oftentimes, as they're forcing these families out, they have bulldozers coming in and just destroying these houses, which is what you see down here, the, the aftermath of some of that, because they want to rebuild this neighborhood. They want to use it for their own purposes. They want to get the black families out and, and repurpose it. So they come in, they tear it down, they force them out, and now anybody who is living there is going to be split up. Um, oftentimes with resettlement, you might get uh, neighbors or even family members who are moved to different areas because now they're going to be resettled into neighborhoods across, you know, all over the place into townships and um, just broken down and moved out. Uh, this one, by the way, if you've never seen District 9, it's a really, really good movie. And uh, it takes place in South Africa, and it is, I wouldn't even say thinly veiled. Like it's a it's a direct reference to um, apartheid and just the um, the kind of stuff you see going on there. And and as this little like movie factoid thing tells you, it's actually based on a place called District Six, which was a mixed race neighborhood of Cape Town. So um, if you've never seen District Nine, it's uh, something you could watch while we're you know all sheltering in place here at home. And you can say that it's official, you know, history schoolwork because you're getting a look into uh, what apartheid South Africa was like. Um, it's a movie that should have a sequel, but has not gotten one yet. So, boohoo. So anyway, um, this resettlement process is going to be repeated all across South Africa. We're going to see a total of about three and a half million people uh, moved to these townships, these areas on the, like even more outskirts of cities. And at this point, we're basically looking at slums. Um, they are just slapped together ramshackle houses. They've got, for the most part, no toilets, no running water, no modern necessities. They're putting seven to 14 people into each one of these houses. And the house is a uh, very generous term for it. Basically these shacks, huge overcrowding, all kinds of problems uh, with like crime, for example. Uh, we got, for example, Soito right here, the, and again, I'm, pronouncing everything wrong i know it um the largest of these that is two million of these moved people are going to be put into one township and because the apartheid government doesn't really prioritize amenities or like supporting black communities at all they're completely lacking in necessities beyond just you know the housing stuff but like schools healthcare, firefighters police because all these things are lacking, you then get a huge crime problem in these neighborhoods because you've got poverty, you've got no support, you've got no police. So obviously like crime gangs basically start taking over huge areas, all these issues that come with poverty. And then the apartheid government turns around and goes, look, see, this is proof. Look at what these African communities turn into when we let them live in the cities on their own and they start using it as like a justification for how they're treating them. So if you're living in a township, now you're poor, you're dealing with crime, you're dealing with all these um, lack of amenities, you still have to get to work, but now you have to commute multiple, multiple miles to get to work in the cities because that's where your job is. Otherwise, you're screwed. You're spending time and money you don't really have. But I mean, what else are your other options? You've got to do it. And if you don't want to do this, where are you going to go? The reserves? The reserves are just as bad as the townships are, but you don't have the city nearby, so you have even less chance of making money. You're basically, your, your options are being taken further and further and further away, and you're being left with nothing. That leads us to um, kind of the height of Grand Apartheid when things get uh, kind of the worst and it kind of levels out at this really bad point for a while before it eventually like way way later starts to get better this is another one of those ones that could be a contender for the most important part of apartheid it is definitely seen by the national party as a flagship of grand apartheid and this is where they finally are going to um, go after that goal of completely separating blacks and whites in South Africa. They want to make two entirely different nations. And much like we saw with resettlement, they're going to start this a little bit early. In 1951, they set up the Bantu Authorities Act. I mentioned that um, we were going to talk about the Bantu Authorities Tax when we saw it in that uh, past book. Well, here it is. This basically goes and makes regional authorities based in each one of those reserves that has been set up. And they are basically here trying to lead, like legitimize the idea of separate governments. 
So they take away the right to vote for black people in South Africa. They take away their ability to live in society, but they have these reserves set up and then they start setting up governments in each reserve and going, look, these are the governments that are you know, responsible for dealing with the Bantus, dealing with the black people in South Africa. Uh, in 1959, then, we start seeing this really pick up. This is going to be the, um, the, the core of this movement starting, the Bantu Self-Government Act. Here's that Verward guy again, the dude who was in charge of education there. Uh, he is now the one that's like his government is passing this. And um, this is going to be basically what sets up the idea of the homeland system. It divides the African population into eight distinct ethnic groups. So no, it's no longer, you know... Um, enough to just say like they're black or they're african now there's like different uh groups within that african category later this eight is actually expanded out to ten and each group then is assigned a white commissioner general because of course you can't have a black person in charge you got to have a white person in charge and that white commissioner general is in charge of making sure that each group uh properly air quotes here uh, transitions to um, another air quotes self-government right so basically taking away all the responsibility from white south africa and just shoving it on to these bantu authorities they set up in 1951 so now the white government is able to argue that blacks are no longer their political responsibility in any way this also means that immediately all black africans regardless of if they live in the homelands or not are given um, ability to vote in homeland selections Basically, what white South Africa is doing here is trying to make it very clear that they're separate countries, right? Because now they could be like, well, they don't have the ability to vote in our elections because they're not part of our government. They, they're part of the Bantu government. So what this means is many things. But a big one is black Africans now are not going to be, for example, protected by any kind of law that would protect white Africans because they're they're not the same group. They're separate and, and they're different nations. In 1970 then, so we're actually getting outside of our, you know, 1964 cutoff, but again, that cutoff makes no sense. So um, we're going to learn some stuff outside of it anyway. In 1970 then, um, this gets taken to its extreme where it kind of like starts um, really solidifying that process there is a decree, not even necessarily like an act, it's just a decree by the government of South Africa that all black South Africans are now citizens of their homelands, not the Republic of South Africa, which would now be white South Africa. So this is, um, before I had mentioned, essentially you were no longer a part, right? Like white South Africa was, was setting it up that you were no longer a white South African. Well, now you're not a citizen of South Africa at all. You are a citizen of your homeland. So now you've got millions of black South Africans that are living in those cities. They're not in the homelands at all. You are a foreigner now. You can be deported at any time into homelands that you have no resources in. So you better uh, shut up and step in line, basically, because if the, the white community decides they don't like your presence, you could just be removed. Uh, so this allows white South Africa to continue to, to utilize and take advantage of that cheap labor with you know no labor laws in place for them because they can do whatever they want. So as we move through the 1970s then, the homelands are going to start to become, uh, again, air quotes here, independent. More plans are in place for the 1980s, but in the 1980s, apartheid starts to kind of fall apart. So um, the rest of those homelands don't ever achieve their independence and eventually they're just brought back into South Africa anyway. The problem with the independent homelands, and the reason why I put independent in quotes here, is because they're not really independent in any way. They're led by corrupt and brutal oligarchies that do not have the interests of the people in mind and are just trying to gather as much money as they can for themselves. The, the homelands are not given the resources or opportunity to create valid governments because what the South African government actually does is gives direct financial and sometimes even military support to these oligarchs as long as they keep the homelands under control. Because again, white South Africa doesn't actually care about the well-being of these homelands. What they care about is exercising domination over this region, right? So the last thing they would want is an actual functioning homeland government that could actually, you know, maybe do well. What they want is somebody who's going to do whatever they tell them to do. 
and you know screw how it affects the people living there so um this is one of those bantu stuns those homelands there was actually several pictures and the guys you looked at at the beginning here uh, i mean the, we're looking at horrendous living conditions here we got a bunch of those just slapped together houses you can see them going all the way down the line here we've got no like sewage system we've got people out just like burning stuff because they, they need warmth there's no heating systems there's nothing in any of these houses that's going to be uh, good for them so the Bantustans then are going to continue being incredibly overcrowded. At this point, we're looking at about 55% of South Africa's population, because remember, a, a lot of black Africans are living in the white cities, so they're not going to be in the homelands. So we have like, you know, 55%, over half of the population living on 13% of the land. Again, that land is incredibly um, lacking in everything. So they have no real ability to make money. They're massive poverty issues they're completely disjointed because not only are the homelands disconnected from each other again looking at geography here right like like this is one homeland right here how are you supposed to govern a country that's in five different actually six different pieces and one of them's way over here like how how do you function as a government if you had to do that like imagine if the united states was like california texas florida new york and ohio and you, you just had to, to, like, you got no direct contact between anybody. Like, how is that supposed to work, right? So the, the idea of, like, geographic disjointed, but then also the residents of these Bantustans often have no ideological or nationalistic connection to these homelands because they're not their actual homelands. They're territory that white South Africans decided they wanted to live in. Um, like they, they have no connection here. It's like, you know, Native American reserves in America. Like you, you just get shoved into it and that's where you have to live now. This allows the population of the Republic of South Africa, white South Africa, to exclusively benefit off of this while the population of black South Africa just suffers um, and just completely shunned beyond any kind of how can we benefit from you. Uh, importantly, the Bantustans, as much as the Republic of South Africa wants the, the global community to recognize that they are now separate governments, luckily most of the global community um, realizes how BS that is, and they never really recognize them as independent countries. They continue to argue that they are the responsibility of the Republic of South Africa, which they are. Um, and the outrage over um, this treatment and this approach to it is actually going to be one of the big factors that eventually ends apartheid. So that's good. Um, you can see over here, by the way, um, just the extent of how bad this stuff gets. So there's 19 million black people in South Africa with 4.5 million white uh, land allocation, obviously just flipped there. Uh, the share of the national income less than 20% to 75%, ratio of average earnings 1 to 14, minimum taxable income is less than half. This one is horrendous. Doctors per population, for every 44,000 Africans, there's one doctor. The infant mortality rate then, that is so bad. That almost, in, in rural areas, in the homelands, almost half of infants die, even in the cities. That is a fifth of all infants that are dying. That infant mortality rate is is unheard of. Um, annual expenditure on education per pupil is is nothing. You see, this is how it gets even more than that one to seven uh, going on there. That's like a one to 15-ish. Sure, that's some quick math in my head. That's probably wrong. Um, teacher pupil ratio. I can't even imagine as a teacher trying to teach 60 students at once. That's not gonna happen ever. But that's you know what you're expected to do. Remember, this one teacher is not a well-trained teacher because of the low salaries they're getting. So uh, this is apartheid. This is what South Africa is living under for basically from 1948 to the late 1980s, early 1990s, for almost half a century. This is the uh, the society that they are dealing with, and we will see next week then um, what resistance that is going to look like and what protests that looks like. So thank you guys for listening. Have a good day.